Welcome back to GraveyardDance.com. How are you all today? I don't know what the weather is like where you are, but it's absolutely wonderful here where we are in the States. It was such a nice day. We decided to break out our boat and start getting it cleaned up and ready for the first boating trip this year. As many people are, I absolutely love being on the water. Not so much in the water, just on the water. I don't know why really. I like to go fishing once in a while, but I hate the taste of fish. The ones I'd catch, I would usually get them cleaned and give them to my folks. They loved fish or to friends who did. For me though, it was all about floating way out to the middle of a huge lake and just laying back after I lowered the anchor and just listening to the gentle waves lapping at the side of the boat. It was also about hearing the birds and seagulls, storks and other similar birds doing whatever it is that birds do in the distance and the peace and solitude of not having to hear anything or anyone for hours on end. When you come from a life that's as chaotic as mine, you kind of learn to appreciate times like these. Anywho, it made me think of this old model ship I had even I was a kid. From the time I was born, I came out thinking about old schooner ships and vessels of the past. I did a past life hypnotherapy thing once and the woman doing it said that I had been a sailor in a past life and ironically, that I was married in my past life to the same woman I am married to in this life today. That's a whole other video though. Today, it got me to thinking about the strangest and most curious cases of ships vanishing. So sit back, imagine you're on a hammock on a boat and you're floating peacefully in calm waters. Before you do all that though, be sure and check out today's sponsor which is of course Eyes of a Dog. Eyes of a Dog is a nationwide animal rescue project started by a good friend of mine all the way back in the early 2000s. It started off as a benefit charity event for a small city in Missouri and has since morphed into a nationwide animal rescue directory. If you're looking to adopt a dog or cat, search Eyes of a Dog. If you need pet supplies, Eyes of a Dog. If you want to search random pet-related videos on a wide array of topics, again, Eyes of a Dog. You can find it all and more at eyesofadog.com. With all that said, let's float on and start the search for the first missing ship. Let's start off with the Flor de la Mar. The story of the Flor de la Mar, also known as the Flower of the Sea, is one filled with grandeur, adventure, and ultimately tragedy. This magnificent Portuguese carrack was built in Lisbon in 1502 and became one of the most renowned vessels of its time. Let's delve into the history of this illustrious ship from its construction to its fateful disappearance off the coast of Sumatra. The Flor de la Mar was constructed in 1502 in Lisbon, Portugal as a flagship vessel for the Portuguese India run. At 400 tons, it was an impressive carrack, nearly double the size of any ships that had previously undertaken such voyages. Under the command of Estevão da Gama, a cousin of Vasco da Gama, the Flor de la Mar embarked on its maiden voyage from Portugal to India in 1502. However, its return journey in 1503 was fraught with challenges. The ship's large size and weight made it difficult to maneuver, especially in treacherous waters like the Mozambique Channel. Leaks sprung, repairs were necessary, and delays ensued. Despite these setbacks, the Flor de la Mar eventually made it back to Portugal by late 1503. Subsequent voyages under different commanders faced similar difficulties. João de Nova led the ship on another India run in 1505 as part of the Portuguese fleet. The ship encountered leaks once again in the Mozambique Channel during its return trip in 1506, leading to extended stays for repairs. The cycle of repairs and challenges continued until it was encountered by Tristeo de Cunha's Armada in February 1507. Under Afonso de Albuquerque's command, the Flor de la Mar played a crucial role in various conquests in the Indian Ocean. It supported the conquests of Goa in 1510 and Malacca in 1511. Laden with treasures looted from Malacca's Sultanate Palace, the ship set sail for Portugal but met its tragic end off Sumatra's coast later that year. In November 1511, while sailing along Sumatra's northeastern coast after departing Malacca, the Flor de la Mar encountered a fierce storm. Attempts to seek refuge failed as the ship was battered by winds and waves. Ultimately, it struck shoals, split apart, and sank during a harrowing night on November 20th. The loss was immense. Over 400 lives perished along with the treasure-laden vessel. The treasure aboard the Flor de la Mar has captured imaginations for centuries. Estimates suggest a vast fortune including gold, jewels, precious artifacts, and more may have been lost with the ship. 
Despite numerous attempts to locate and salvage the wreck over the years by various parties claiming salvage rights, including Portugal, Indonesia, and Malaysia, no definitive discovery has been made. The Flor de la Mar stands as a symbol of maritime exploration and colonial ambition during the Age of Discovery. Its construction marked a milestone in naval technology, while its tragic end serves as a reminder of both glory and loss on the high seas. The second ship we will talk about today is the HMS Endeavour. The story of the HMS Endeavour is one that intertwines the realms of exploration, scientific discovery, and naval history. From its humble beginnings as a merchant collier named Earl of Pembroke to its transformation into a renowned research vessel under the command of Lieutenant James Cook, the Endeavour played a pivotal role in expanding Western knowledge of the South Pacific and laying the groundwork for British colonization efforts. Let's delve into the fascinating journey of this iconic ship, from its construction to its mysterious disappearance. The HMS Endeavour had a rather unassuming origin as the merchant collier Earl of Pembroke, built in 1764 by Thomas Fishburne for Thomas Milner in Whitby, Yorkshire. This sturdy ship, known locally as the Whitby Cat, was designed with a flat-bottomed hull that allowed it to navigate shallow waters and be easily beached for loading and repairs. Constructed from traditional materials like white oak, elm, pine, and fir, the Earl of Pembroke was repurposed for a grander mission when the Royal Navy purchased it in 1768. Under the direction of Lieutenant James Cook, who was chosen by the Admiralty to lead a scientific expedition to the Pacific Ocean, the ship underwent significant modifications at Deptford before setting sail as His Majesty's Bark Endeavour. The vessel was refitted with additional cabins, a powder magazine, and storerooms to accommodate both scientific equipment and crew members for an extended voyage into uncharted territories. In August 1768, with Cook at the helm, the Endeavour embarked on its historic journey from Plymouth towards Tahiti. The primary objective was to observe the transit of Venus across the Sun, a crucial astronomical event that would help refine calculations of Earth's distance from the Sun. However, hidden within sealed orders was a secret mission, to search for Terra Australis Incognita or the unknown Southern Land, and claim any valuable territories for Great Britain. The voyage took the endeavor through Tahiti, New Zealand where it became the first European vessel to reach since Abel Tasman's expedition over a century earlier and eventually to Australia's east coast. In April 1770, Cook landed at Botany Bay, now part of Sydney, marking the first European contact with Australia's eastern shores. The ship continued north along Australia's coastline before encountering peril on the Great Barrier Reef. Endeavour narrowly avoided disaster after running aground on the treacherous Great Barrier Reef in June 1770. To lighten her load and free her from danger, Cook ordered some cannons to be thrown overboard while essential repairs were made during seven weeks spent beached on Australian soil. Despite this setback, Endeavour managed to limp into Batavia, modern-day Jakarta, for further repairs before commencing her return voyage back to England. After completing her epic three-year journey around Cape Horn and across vast oceans back home, Endeavour arrived in Dover in July 1771. Following her illustrious Pacific voyage, she faded into obscurity serving mundane tasks like transporting troops until being sold into private hands in 1775. Renamed yet again and repurposed for timber transport from Baltic regions before meeting her final fate during American War of Independence. The ultimate fate of HMS Endeavour remains shrouded in mystery despite historical evidence suggesting she met her end during a blockade off Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island in 1778. Reports indicate she was scuttled alongside other British transports near Goat Island, but exact details surrounding her final resting place have eluded discovery. While relics from Endeavour are displayed in maritime museums worldwide and replicas pay homage to her legacy today, including NASA's Space Shuttle Endeavour, her physical remains have yet to be definitively located underwater off Newport Harbor. The story of the Patanila, a twin-masted steel-hulled schooner that vanished without a trace in 1988, is one shrouded in mystery and intrigue. Owned by wealthy West Australian businessman Alan Nicholl, the Patanila was on a routine voyage from Fremantle to Airlie Beach in Queensland when it disappeared off the coast of Sydney. The vessel, known for its robust construction and advanced technology, was crewed by experienced sailors including Skipper Ken Jones, his wife Noreen, and two young deckhands. 
The Patanila embarked on its fateful journey on October 16, 1988, with a crew of four and the owner aboard for part of the trip. As it made its way across the Great Australian Bight towards Queensland, everything seemed normal until a distressing call from Ken Jones' son revealed financial troubles back home. This call marked the beginning of a series of events that would lead to speculation about what truly happened to the Patanila. On November 8, 1988, as the Patanila approached Botany Bay off the coast of Sydney, skipper Ken Jones radioed a message indicating they had run out of fuel and were tacking eastward. Subsequent calls requesting weather reports and directions to Maruya raised eyebrows due to their unusual nature. The final cryptic message mentioning being 300 kilometers south before fading into static marked the last communication from the vessel. Following the disappearance of the Patanila, an extensive investigation involving maritime experts and search and rescue teams was launched. A coronial inquest concluded that the schooner likely collided with a larger vessel and sank due to a hit-and-run incident. However, alternate theories such as hijacking or murder-suicide have been proposed by experts who doubt the initial findings. Reports of sightings by witnesses further complicate the mystery surrounding the fate of the Patanila. The case of the Patanila remains one of Australia's most baffling maritime mysteries, with no definitive answers regarding what truly happened to the vessel and its crew. The disappearance continues to captivate investigators and enthusiasts alike, leaving behind a legacy of unanswered questions and speculation. We hope you enjoyed our video today, and maybe even learned something new in the process. If you have a story suggestion, feel free to head to our site. There is a suggestion form at the top of the page. Thanks for watching everyone. Till next time.